is the uh, Northampton Conservation Commission meeting for the 12th of December 2013 uh, with a standard opening statement. Uh, Conservation Commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment in Northampton. We are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act. Our duties also include open space acquisition and management. But primarily, we focus on, on carrying out the provisions of the Wetlands Act and the Northampton Wetlands Ordinance. We operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meetings, dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance. We invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask that the public limit their comments to issues within our purview. Uh, today, the agenda is uh, Request for determination about the ability to determine the driveway, parking lot, and landscape improvements within the buffer zone as subject to the Wetlands Act or uh, what the Wetlands Ordinance is, uh, I guess the Wetlands Act is the relevant thing because this is the Mass Department of Transportation uh, headquarters uh, of Massachusetts. Uh, next, uh, a continuation for request for determination. Applicability to determine the septic installation in the riverfront area uh, of the Broad Brook is and uh, buffer zone is subject to the Wetlands Protection Act for the improvements. This is 28 Martin South Drive. Uh, we have a, a presentation on organic land management from North Northampton and uh, continued discussions of uh, consideration of amendments to the land use regulations. Uh, so I'll start first to see if there's any uh, motion to make uh, public comment. John. Yeah, um, John Masta from West Farms, which is where Mineral Hills, Sawmill Hills, all the different places are. Uh, I've lived out in that area for 63 years. Um, it's probably been one of the best wildlife places out there. It's always been not too much of a problem, but as development comes in and, and you've got the Northampton watershed, you've got two conservation areas, there's a bigger and bigger buffer for wildlife and the spillover comes onto my land. So, I mean, I have deer damage, I have deer problems, the coyotes get too friendly. I've talked to people from Fish and Wildlife about this and other communities that have conservation land. And one of the situations is people say they want to hike in the fall. Well, you designate one parcel every other year as open to hunting, let the people know that this area is hunting, that could happen in this area, and have the other one completely open. This way, the wildlife is not gonna get as comfortable and it will stay wildlife. And I think this is a simple situation. Everybody gets a little bit of something and you know, we still have the land used. Thank you. Anybody else? Sir. It's Mark Carmine, Turkey Hill Road. Uh, I think it's, I state the obvious when I say that when you open up uh, when you're starting allowing weapons to be discharged on public land where the public uses the land, you make the land less safe for the public. <clears throat> and why would you change a policy that makes the land less safe for the public to use? And uh, there are plenty of other places for hunters to hunt in Northampton even, and uh, the small amount of conservation land we have I think should remain free from hunting as it's been um, for as long as I don't remember. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? Okay, next is uh, approval of minutes. Sarah sent out electronically uh, two sets of minutes. Uh, let's take them one at a time. First is a motion to approve minutes of October 10th. Mm -hmm. Second? Second. Any uh, modifications, amendments to those minutes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Uh, motion to approve the minutes of November 14th. Second? Second. Oh, yes. Second. Any amendment uh, or, or uh, modifications of those minutes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Uh, first item, a request for determination about the ability to determine the driveway, parking lot, and landscape improvements within the buffer zone subject to the Weapons Protection Act. This is uh, the Mass uh, Department of Transportation District 2 headquarters. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Tim Meyer with Mass DOT. I work out of the North Hampton office, known as District 2. Um, you are correct, we um, would like to do some work at our facility. I've, you've probably seen some of the building activity that's going on there. Um, the idea is that we'd like to um, repave the driveway and the parking lots. And you all have a copy of the sketch for it. As you can probably see from the sketches that <laughs> Pretty much most of the work is actually going to be occurring in the town of Hatfield. The only area we're looking for really from the city of Northampton is the north driveway, probably about two-thirds of the north driveway, and then the south driveway, pretty much um, up to the parking areas. That one we don't have. Yeah. You don't have? Yeah. No, we have the location sketch. Yeah. This is this is a north driveway right here. Yeah. Does everyone This is the North Driveway right here. This mm -hmm. is North King Street, Route 5. Yeah, yeah. So basically from here up to about two-thirds of the way up uh, into the driveway is what we want to cold plain and resurface. And we do have a wetland on the north side of the property, and we also have a drainage swale and some BBW located between the two driveways. I remember the swale when we were pulling trees out of there. Oh, that was further on down, uh, well, down towards 91, right, uh, the 91 ramps. And then the south driveway, it's basically the same thing, going from Route 5, pretty much just right up to here. Now we do, we will like to um, do some landscaping improvements. What we want to do is put a stone dust pad here and like a picnic table, just as an um, you know, area for the employees. And a lot of times we do have some visitors come in here just to take a break from driving, you know, use the facilities or the restroom and whatnot. And then, you know, I've even seen a uh, father and his sons playing football out there, playing catch just to break up their dry, so it's kind of interesting. But um, stone dust pad is, is going to be close to the buffer zone, and we do propose to put some erosion controls up just to prevent any, any possibility of uh, erosion getting into the, or sediment getting into the wetland. There are three catch basins along the south driveway that are located in the city of Northampton, and they're up here basically close to the um, wetland area. There's two here in the driveway, and then there's one just as you're going around the curve here. Uh, we'd like to clean those catch basins out, adjust them as necessary, or rebuild them if um, they're deteriorated. That's pretty much it as far as the work area. There is, a, as you mentioned, there is a wetland on the south side also that um, basically extends a wetland and a, and a drainage soil that extends from the south driveway all the way down to the 91 um, southbound off ramp. Pretty basic in nature, um, and again, the only areas we're really proposing erosion controls are right here in this corner where we're actually doing excavation. Um, this is just going to be cold plain and resurface, so there's really going to be no soil disturbances. Questions? Commissioner Bell? Yes. Um, yeah, so I didn't have a detailed plan, but we don't have a detailed plan. So what work is actually happening within the buffer zone? Within the buffer zone, here's the buffer zone here. So this is the buffer zone. Yep. So we'll be cold planing and resurfacing so this all area. all of that yep. is within the buffer zone, including this Including part. that. And actually a little chunk is, is in uh, the town of Hatfield. But it, it is a wetland in Northampton, so it's under yeah. your jurisdiction. So then you're not proposing any erosion controls? The erosion controls are, are right here, along here. This not is all curved, okay. and we're not really excavating down to um, soil. We're just going to shave off the top two inches of um, pavement on there, and then put it back. So there's there's really going to be no soil exposure along along the driveway. The only area we're going to be doing any work and maybe a little bit of excavating grading is within this confined area for the stone dust pad and picnic table. Where do you dispose of the cold plain material? That's up to the contractor. A lot of them bring it back to their facility and recycle it. Um, sometimes the towns, uh, cities, towns ask for it, but uh, there's not going to be really a lot from out of Northampton. There'll probably be a ton from <laughs> from the town of Hatfield, um, but it, it, typically the contractor is responsible for getting rid of it, and, and they bring it back to the um, asphalt plants for recycling. Yeah, I, I've seen towns use it on dirt roads. Yep. <clears throat> sometimes they put it under guardrails, milling mulch under guardrail, just to prevent the weeds from growing up through. Other questions? Jerry, your comments on the uh, 
still happened in previously disturbed areas? Yeah, it didn't seem like any new disturbance was really happening here. <coughs> that parking area, right? The new parking pad or the stone dust area with the picnic tables. Right, that's all grass braided area lawn, and there's some bushes there that we'll have to reuse. But again, it's it's basically like Sarah mentioned all previously disturbed area. Well, you're you're adding stone dust in an area that's currently lawn within buffer zone. Yeah, that that's yeah. in a yeah, piece of information. For me. Uh, it seems like everything else was in previously paved, uh, impervious area, but stone dust pretty much becomes impervious and impervious. We, we were looking at the idea of um, porous pavers. Mm -hmm. The designer was um, going to check the price to make sure it fit within the budget. Uh, is that something you might be interested in? Yeah. A porous paving type, uh, you know, they, they have the blocks with the... Right. Yeah, grass close yeah, up. Yeah, grass close up in between. And yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's something that... Uh, much better option, I think. That's something we could definitely do. Mm -hmm. So I think as long as, yeah, as long as all the previously disturbed areas Stays disturbed that disturbed area. The new stuff, I guess, if it's even if it's previous pavers, and that actually kind of becomes disturbed, right? Well, but a, 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 a graded lawn area that's maintained as lawn is I mean, it's pervious, but it's a little bit disturbed. So uh, as long as it's still pervious, uh, I take my, my my concern. I mean, I think that. Uh, it should last. I'm not going to be driving trucks over. Right. No, it's just <coughs> it yeah. probably used three or four times a week if maybe the small person will go out and sit at the picnic table and do what they do. Motion to close or public comments? Question? Motion to close? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, so Sarah's uh, recommendation is negative determination. Checking box three to indicate that the work is within buffer zones but will not constitute an alteration. Uh, conditions requiring erosion control or work is within buffer zones and notification prior to the start of work and when the work is completed. We might add that previous favor requirement rather than stone dust yep. as the material. Yep. Uh, All right, so move. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you. system and technology for the state. Title 5 will be installed at a later date. So right. Led me to believe the Board of Health has that copy. Okay. And they're holding on to it until, until after you guys are done. He, he, okay. He's approved it already, but he won't give it to us until you guys are done. Mm. So, I mean, that's... Yeah, the drainage swale and I guess the amount of grading in the back. Yeah, um, if you look at you look at it. I can Is that a one slope? Actually, I kind of did this this afternoon. That's kind of what the grass and swale is going to look like. Yes. 
going to be, I'm trying it about five feet wide, maybe four, four or five inches deep, and it's just going to be a little thing that goes, yeah. that goes mm -hmm. around. So it is in here. Yeah. What's, how steep is the slope? Is it That's three? a three to one. Yeah. Three to one, okay. And, and in here, I put a poly barrier. Okay. A 40 mil, mil, otherwise, I'd be going out 10 more feet. Yeah, you're required. Yeah, so I got a 15 yeah. foot breakout that I cut back to 10, uh, to five feet. Okay. Otherwise, this thing would be a lot bigger. Hence, you need the poly barrier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, all the water's going this way anyway. Right. This leach field is right here, and that's kind of like a little knoll there. So it's all going down that way anyway. This is just kind of redirecting the water around the new leach field. Mm -hmm. There's really no other place on the property to put it. I mean, this is all. This is all went out back there. Where would the reserve be? Um, the reserve is going to have to be. You're going to have to dig it out, put a new one in. Cause oh, like, okay. The, yeah. The, we're going to leave old. that. Yeah. Leave that. These are six feet apart, so it's not a reserve. So, in in the event that that fails, uh, and it won't for a long time, um, they'll have to dig it out, put a new one in. This is no, there's no room. They couldn't use the uh, this. Well, by, by I suppose the time, they could. It, by the time, yeah. Get by the time that that yeah. is over, yeah, they're still going to have pipes in there and stone in there, but just, right. that's easy enough to get out. Well, they only took. Okay, you're in the garage, so you have yeah. to be ten feet away. Right? Yeah. Well, well that yeah. the garage or part of this building was added after that. That's mm -hmm. why it's so close. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that, that was my big concern was that this wasn't the final plan. That's, that's the RDA, that's for you guys. The Board of Health does have the final one. Okay. And he said he, it's approved, but he can't release it until you guys are done with, done with your order or whatever. Other questions from commissioners? And sir, your uh, Comments about the new field being vegetated is currently a, a lawn area. Right, it will be afterwards. Is, is that what you were referring to? Just the maintenance of, of, the, of the surface? Of the yeah, there was a note that made me think that maybe it was planned to be used for a parking area. No. Okay. No. That's it. There is. That's a mistake. That's just going to be a lawn and then mow it like, like everything else. Okay. It's basically taking that old leach field and just extending that slope out 20 feet or so. It's basically the same, you know, with a three to one grade. Other questions for the Motion to close. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, so staff recommendation. We go to, uh, as long as the reach field will be vegetated and the swale is appropriately satisfied with the swale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so we're going to affect the uh, negative determination will be issued by checking box two. Uh, it is subject to the land check in that area. Uh, will not affect the area of the area subject to protection. Um, motion? Uh, box two or three. Mm -hmm. Is it the bumpers on there? Oh, okay. Keep forgetting about that. So I move the conditions. And uh, uh, Sarah's recommended standing uh, standard conditions. Um, anything you want to add? Okay. So, is that a motion from someone? I did. I did. And second? Second. second. Uh, motion made and seconded with staff recommendations. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Very okay. good. Thanks for coming in. Yep. Thank you. Fair enough. We're a little early for the, the... This isn't a hearing, so if the, um, the presenter is ready to go forward... Then I, I, I was that. hoping that, was the that uh, if Grofman Northampton is ready to go uh, 10 minutes early, we're ready to hear you. Yeah, oh, sure. Okay.
Yes, by all means, let's see. We have one more than a quarter. Okay. All right. What is your size? We're seven. presentation. Um, my name is Laura Fisher. I'm a law student at Western New England. I grew up on a farm in East Hampton and I went to undergrad at Smith College um, and I interned with Grow Food this summer and I am still volunteering with them. Um, huh? <laughs> you looked over Yeah, you guys moved over. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to talk about really briefly and I'm sure it's just a really quick refresher for you guys is the legal basis for creating policy for um, conservation uh, parcels that can be used for agricultural purposes, where that power comes from and what such policy might look like, how it can be implemented. And I'll also give a couple of examples of different municipalities that have um, effectively put into play agricultural policies that, are, that have an eye toward uh, conservation value. So can we, I don't know how we go with this. Thanks. This is just really quick. Uh, as you read into the minutes at the very beginning of the meeting, um, this even predates the Wetlands Protection Act, which I know is probably about 90% of the work that you do. Um, so the Initial Conservation Commission Act is what grants the power to acquire and manage the properties uh, for conservation and passive recreation. And within the eight functional areas of the commission is the ability to uh, implement uses that would allow for productive and economic work, which includes forestry, fishing, and uh, agriculture. Um, can we go to the next slide? And um, a lot of what I relied on <coughs> in my summary for this presentation is, um, I'm formerly a conservation commissioner myself, and I don't know if you've all seen the giant, like, yay big book from <laughs> MAC. Oh, yes. It's where I pulled a lot of this from, so it's just some, sort of a refresher. So the commissions are, a huge, um, they, they do the principal amount of stewardship on protected land. There are over 200,000 acres in Massachusetts. Um, and next, sorry. Um, and just to underscore this, the final decisions for the use of these lands remains of the Conservation Commission. Uh, this comes directly from the environmental, the um, Max Environmental Handbook for Conservation Commissioners. So it's well within the purview of the Conservation Commission to develop and implement such policy. Um, so what I, a lot of what I pulled from the MAC handbook um, really tries to engage conservation commissions in crafting this land use policy. And I know that it's probably seems like an extra amount of work well and beyond the Wetlands Protection Act uh, permitting that you guys do. Um, but they suggest comprehensive policies for the municipally owned lands um, because once those policies are adopted, it can head off trouble before it starts. And um, the commission should consider the history and the restrictions on each parcel of land and the characteristics of the land because as you know, no parcel is the same. Um, so this, again, just underscores from MAC that this is from the Initial Conservation Commission Act and that the uh, land is controlled by the commission and not other local bodies. Um, and MAC uh, also promotes um, decisions that focus on sort of the functional purposes of a conservation commission and enhancing, restoring, and maintaining the resources of the parcel and other goals. Um, and again, should take into account 
various characteristics of the parcel, including deed restrictions, characteristics of the land. Um, and they suggest that if any extensive farming is going to be proposed for a parcel, that a plan should be developed for that parcel. Um, and licenses can be issued, as you know, for individual parcels um, in furtherance of whatever accepted agricultural use policy is developed. And MAC also advocates for environmentally sound agriculture, um, which would fall into line with a lot of the conservation values that are fundamental to conservation land management. Um, and they even acknowledge that these sorts of practices, which were sort of unusual and uneconomical, are largely accepted. And a lot of conservation commissions, including two that I'll, I'll present quickly to you, um, have been able to implement pretty effectively. Um, and this is again from MAC. Um, it just advocates for avoiding herbicides and pesticides, or alternatively, adoption of integrated pest management techniques um, because, again, these sorts of techniques could and do have a significant bearing on the, the conservation values that a commission is looking to further. MAC also additionally weighs in on GM crops. Um, they say that it should be avoided unless it can be completely contained within the area, and they acknowledge that that's fairly impossible. And just to break down between leases and licenses, um, licenses are from year to year for a short period. Uh, I've seen everywhere from one, three, five, and 10 years. Um, they give fewer rights than a lease does. They don't essentially make someone a tenant if they're a licensee. They're easier to terminate, which if a farmer is not working out, or it, it's just it's easier than creating the legal relationship um, that uh, a lessee and a lessor would have. And actually, commissions cannot themselves enter into lease agreements uh, based on case law. Um, and Northampton does have a right to farm declaration, but within that declaration, um, it actually states that that municipal declaration does not override the um, statutory regulation of the Conservation Commission Act. Um, and so basically, with the individuals that I've talked to from various municipalities, the steps for implementing this would be um, voting to adopt a policy, reading it into minutes, publicizing it, and then issuing a request for proposals, specifying the objectives of the new policy, and then licenses issued in accordance with that policy. So the first place that I talked to was Lincoln, Massachusetts. They have a very progressive and comprehensive farm policy, um, which was actually reviewed and sort of, they were counseled by Alexander Dawson on it, and they've had very good luck. Um, it does create extra work, but they work with their agricultural commission and it's been very effectively implemented. Um, what they do is they most recently updated it in 2013, and they issued copies of it with basically letters asking for basically an RFP to um, former uh, licensees and potential licensees. They issue them for five years at a time, which for people who are practicing sustainable agriculture allows the farmer to sort of invest in the land, which tenure is kind of an issue when you have sustainable agriculture because you're constantly building the soil. Um, so they generally, if, if, if the farmers are in substantial compliance with the license at the conclusion, they have the option to renew. Um, they sort of align themselves with the uh, MAC uh, suggestions. They prefer organic practices, um, they prefer farm practices that work with natural systems, and their licenses allow for longer-term investments by the farmer in the land. Um, the licensees undergo annual reviews during the growing season and a comprehensive review at the termination of the license. Um, if the substantial compliance with the license occurs, 
it's generally expected that they roll over to an additional five-year license. And they view the relationships more as, as long-term partners. Um, again, annually, the farmers have to submit um, sort of a master plan describing the projected year, including pesticide plants, fertilizers, amendments. Um, they have to annually to test their soil. They have to submit an aerial map. Like I said, this is very comprehensive um, and indicate where op operations will occur. So it's, like I said, they're a very comprehensive organization and they work with the Agricultural Commission in their city to do this. Um, so that's Lincoln. And I don't know if the address is next. This is Lincoln. Lincoln, okay. Oh, they also advocate for vegetated buffer strips. Um, they do certain um, agreements for uh, for parcels where there's a lot of grassland bird nesting, so they only allow late haying on some of their parcels. Um, and in 2013, they actually included a, a provision to ban GMOs. Um, and they just said that they were erring on the side of caution. Um, and they just didn't think it was a sustainable practice that they wanted to support. Um, it requires insurance. These are just basic terms of the license. I can, can provide you the, uh, the terms of the policy afterward. Um, and as far as termination goes, it's just 60 days no notice of each party failure to abide by the policy considerations constitutes a cause for termination. Um, and I actually spoke with their conservation director. He was fantastic. He's very involved with this, and he answered a lot of questions for me and provided me with all of their policies and documents. So I can make those available if any of you are interested. Um, and then next, I think, is Amherst. This is a little bit quicker. Um, very similar in scope to Lincoln in the effect. Uh, they require that their farming practices meet uh, national organic standards which means there's no specific uh, language about GM crops, but uh, that standard prohibits the use of GMOs. Uh, and again, they um, advocate for practicing soil conservation techniques. Um, they take into account rare and endangered species, wetland function, and resource quality. Um, they require vegetative buffers um, and encourage planting of cover crops, and they give preference to certain kinds of crops uh, that include food, fiber, fuel, and otherwise serve conservation interests. And they do various licenses, one, three, and 10 years. Um, and similar to Lincoln, they require annual reporting. Um, they also require a degree of insurance, and um, they're revocable. The licenses are revocable because it's easier to terminate than a lease. Um, and I think you spoke. Oh, yeah, that's the wrong email address. Um, I talked to David. <laughs> But um, I have his contact information as well as the policies that they have, and uh, he was very happy to answer questions. Um, so I'm going to take the next part. Uh, my name is also Laura Hilbert, um, and I fairly recently graduated with my master's degree in conservation biology from Antioch, New England, and I work part time for Griffith in Manhattan. Um, so I wanted to talk about the sort of scientific background um, for our argument that. Um, policy <coughs> be enacted around the agricultural land specifically that is under your pur purview. Um, so mostly I'll be talking about um, the effects of conventional farming practices like GMOs and pesticides. Um, although those are two separate things, um, the effect of pesticides is, is one of the things about GMOs that makes them so um, so dangerous. It's, just an indirect effect. Um, so I'll kind of be talking about both of them intermixed. Um, so, you know, it affects um, many species, both in abundance and um, species diversity, and as well as degrading habitats, creating super weeds, which you may or may not have heard of, um, and degrading soil quality. And um, the, the most noticeable thing was that almost all of the studies found fairly inconsistent results. Um, researchers came to all kinds of conclusions. Almost no one could make, you know, state one thing or another. Um, but it was clear, every study I read made it clear that we really don't know what kind of damage could happen and that 
more research needs to be done. Um, so as I talk about this, there are a lot of opinions out there. Um, so pollinators um, are one of the big ones that are affected um, by both indirectly by pesticides and directly through genetically modified pollen that they pick up. Um, these are just a few of the studies that I found. Um, one study found that monarch larvae who fed on milkweed leaves that had been dusted with pollen from genetically modified um, maize had a 20% mortality rate at 48 hours. That compared to 0 to 3% in the um, non-GMO dusted leaves, um, and 37 to 7% at 120 hours. So that was a big effect that they found. Um, tiger swallowtail larvae also had increased mortality, um, as well as the ones that did survive foraged less effectively um, were at a lower weight, both as larvae and as adults, and took longer time to reach adult stage. Um, honeybee larvae um, that were fed in the lab with a diet that included part of the proteinase inhibitor that is part of um, BT um, crops had increased mortality, 25% increase in mortality. 10% um, longer development time, so it took, instead of taking nine and a quarter days to reach adult stage, it took them almost 11 days, um, and a decreased adult body mass of 25% less. Um, it had mostly, mostly pesticides with an indirect effect of genetically modified crops, but um, Roundup sprayed directly on tadpoles, kills them all. Um, and this um, guy, Relia, found that it killed almost 100% of leopard frogs, tree frogs, toads, um, both adults and juveniles. Um, he also looked at pesticides um, in sublethal levels, but that are mixed, as we often see washing down to watersheds, usually you see a mixture of different things. Um, and he found that in different combinations, they, a mixture had killed all of the leopard frogs. He also found that he was seeing changes in behavior, changes in predator-prey predator interactions between various amphibians, both in larva, juvenile, and adult stages. Um, so he summed it up by saying that it seems pretty clear that wetland communities are impacted by even low sublethal concentrations of pesticides. Um, sometimes the effects can be predicted by the effect of the individual pesticide. Sometimes the combinations had um, unexpected lethal results. Um, so I didn't want to take the time to summarize all of the studies that I found, um, but these are a few of the species that had some kind of negative effect from um, mostly the indirect effect of pesticides, increased pesticide use. Um, so yeah, all invertebrates, um, ground invertebrates, dragonflies, um, water bugs, more wetland creatures, um, earthworms had a much longer development time to reach adult stage. Um, small <coughs> mammals are affected primarily through habitat degradation, um, losing the, the mixed sort of habitat um, and then the natural heterogeneity of lots of different weeds and habitat, um, plant heights, um, I think partly affected it. Um, he also, this is the same researcher who did the frog studies, he found that um, the whole wetland community, including zooplankton and phytoplankton, um, were affected. He saw big die-offs in those. Next slide. Um, the super weeds are another problem. We don't see them as much out here, but in the Midwest, they're causing um, lots of issues. Um, what happens is that a combination of rapid adaptation to the pesticides that are being used in strong concentrations, as well as the spreading of genes from genetically modified crops are creating these weeds that can't be killed with the pesticides that we're using. Um, there are already 221 species worldwide, including some of our most common weeds like ragweed, horseweed, 
waving goose grass, red grass. Um, they've been found in 61 countries and 47 states. <coughs> so, um, although, although we can't stop them, you know, the Conservation Commission should consider um, minimizing any, anything we can do for that. Next slide. Um, soil quality is also affected. Gene transfer can occur from the root zone of plants directly to microbial life. Um, the Dunfield study is a really good one um, and was cited by most of the other soil related studies that I read. Um, they, the plants can also release novel proteins into the soil around the root system, um, which selectively increases the growth of some microbial life and decreases others which can throw just the whole soil community out of whack. Um, and then more evidence that leads to shifts in the microbial community based in soil that had not previously been exposed yearly to Roundup, they found that applying it decreased respiration that first year and then subsequently increased respiration. So you definitely see long-term shifts in the microbial life in those fields. So basically our recommendation is we're not recommending that you even write policy that says only organic or no GMOs. What we really would most like to see is an RFP process that is open and that takes into account the conservation value of a farmer's plan. Um, so perhaps creating a committee with a member, a couple members of the CONSCOM, a couple members of the Ag Committee, um, and requiring farmers who are interested to submit a plan similar to um, the ones in Lincoln where they, you kind of say what you're planning to do, what effects it might have, um, and you evaluate it based on how it would or would not protect the land. Um, going back to what the other Laura said, um, this, <laughs> this land is meant to be protected first and farmed second. So you know, protecting the natural resources really should be the first priority. Um, and if Grow Food can offer support to you in any way in establishing that process, we would be happy to talk about that. Um, so if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hmm. And all of the articles I cited are on your handout. Right, no, I see all the. Uh, and I, I can help you access them. You're aware of the sites that are all, that the commission has that are already under agriculture. Yeah, uh, Elwell, Blyman, and uh, the Mineral Hills. Is it those three? I don't think Mineral Hills. Mineral Hills have. Yeah, yeah. That's where it's Sylvester Road. The Sylvester Road parcel. Yeah. Yeah, and I believe Elwell is already organic. So. Yeah, and the, the documents I discussed from the various municipalities who've done this um, are all available. I can email them, um, and the various conservation directors we spoke with are um, very accessible. So, so uh, uh, just had a, a question. You say that Lincoln has a, uh, a policy that uh, references the MACC requirements and uh, therefore, either overtly or, or implicitly, talks about requiring organic practices. And but you're saying, rather than um, make a policy about that, uh, to invite an open uh, RFP process. And I wonder why, why not have a policy? Well, I, 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 I might have said it right. I would like to see that in an ideal world. Yeah. Um, um, but knowing that emotions are running high and I just wanted to make clear that we're not coming demanding that. That's not the only path. <laughs> right. What we would yeah. most like to see is that, you know, we really take into account the conservation value. If, if, we, if we had to do it, we would definitely write that in. Um, but, you know, there may be a situation where you need to lease the land and there isn't someone who can do it organically and you can still judge between the relative value hmm. of, you know, yeah. conventional practices. I mean, writing policy and implementing it, um, I think we aimed for just an open RFP process with 
these objectives because I know how much work these other municipalities have put into um, developing policy, issuing licenses in accordance with that policy. And it is more work. And it's like. Well, I, and it, I, I, you know, Amherst has uh, two and two thirds right. FTEs. Uh, yeah. We have one third of Sarah. Uh, I don't know what Lincoln's is, but you apparently have a paid conservation director yes. there yeah. too. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we. There are real differences for sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, staff availability is, is, is one of the issues. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we don't have that many vulnerable areas. Right. Yeah. We have a fourth one too, that Montcalm Avenue thing. Oh. Very tiny. Montcalm, the, 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 the little tiny. Yeah, that's early before. Yeah, that's oh, it is? No. Okay. Uh, it will eventually, I think, once they iron out their differences. Well, how uh, Lily. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think the RFP process might surprise you too. I think there is a perception in the city that there is not demand for the land, that you know there's no point in putting an RFP out because no one would come forward anyway. And, and I think that you know, just in the last five, ten years, the demand for farmland has really shifted. And even land that would be perceived as poor tillable land could be great pasture land because livestock production is taking off in this city. So I think that, um, you know, opening it up gives everybody a chance to throw their their plan in the hat and for you to pick among the best of them. Mm -hmm. And it, why not? I mean, what's the downside of that? And if it's a matter of, you know, because it's, it's, it's work and, and that's an evaluation process that it takes time, then that's where we'd love to have a conversation with you because we have gone through cons uh, evaluation processes now four or five <coughs> times um, leasing out our land and we you know we'd be happy to have a conversation about how we can support that Great. and I, I think you're right that the uh, uh, market has changed in the last probably three or four years and then ten years but just very recent yeah. Yeah. General Master. I, I, I need to be careful about this opening thing uh, in East Hampton they had a problem a few years ago Bill Chickman who has a big beef operation up in East Hampton uh, has been using the, the town farmland over there for many, many years. They put out an R, RFP or whatever it is, and someone from Chigby came in and bit him away, and he almost had to stop his operation before they finally corrected it and went back because that was a vital component to his operation, being close to his thing and providing that much feed. So, I mean, if you do this, you're going to have to look a little bit more carefully at all the factors. So. I mean, it's just something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Amherst does have a provision um, in their policy that they give preference to local farmers. Um, mm -hmm. That would be helpful. Yeah, and I think what would be important too. Well, is I, I would be surprised if there were one of my kids is farming, so. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, I would think that yeah, that there's there's likely to be a local interest. I don't think you'll have to go very far afield to find people with yeah. interest. Yeah, and it, it, the way that Lincoln described it as well was. If, if people are happy with the way things are operating and they're in substantial compliance with what they needed to be doing on the land, it was pretty much that they had some long-term people who they were very happy with that they weren't just about to rip things away from. So, um, Just a yeah. specific question, Sarah. What, what length of uh, license are we able to grant? We are doing five years. Yeah, five years. Yeah, five years. Yeah. We previously thought that we could only do three, but yeah. the, the next thing that was what I was remembering. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, this, as I'm recalling, this came up because uh, we had renewed a, a license, I think, for the Sylvester Road uh, parcel without really thinking much about it because we had never thought much about it. There was not a lot of uh, uh, public interest, and, and uh, so if somebody wanted to keep doing it, we pretty much let them keep doing it. And when it uh, when there was a uh, uh, a complaint that some downstream um, uh, residue of uh, uh, it was probably Roundup, but some some uh, herbicide was um, then finding its way off that parcel, uh, it caused us to think, oh well, maybe we ought to have something more formal by way of a process by which the licenses get granted, and um, uh, we're grateful to you for helping us get smart enough to be able to. Sure. Um, 
I thought they were going for organic uh, certification or something. Or was that just a section? That where? The, the Sylvester World thing. It's not really yeah, Sylvester. That's, 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 that's Elwell. That Elwell. Yeah. Not, not Elwell. Yeah. Yeah. It's not Elwell. It's the, it crosses the Mill River. It's that big farm that we had. Oh, I was in Meadow Street out in Florence? Yeah. We, yeah, had, well, we had discussions on forever with farmers and Conscom and Yeah, that's whole. that's Grow Food Northampton's right. community right. farm. I think you're describing. Yeah. Part of us, right? That's not it's not conservation well, the only conservation one well, is, is along the river. Yeah, we were involved in the discussions on that. Oh, yeah. That's sort of in a peripheral way why we're here, too. <laughs> well, the, the, the right, beauty well, that, that's, a, that's a, a related but, uh, but, but separate but not, question. Yes, about, exactly. So what, what kinds of turf management practices might be uh, best used next to Grow Food Northampton Farm? And your conservation and land along the river. Yeah, but we um, wanted to be clear that this we're specifically talking about the conservation right, energy management system. One, one step at a time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure if it would help you to have our contact info. I would give it to you or... Oh, sure, please. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I write it on the board? Or is, won't you write it on the... Um, what, you it, you it, 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 just make sure it's dry erase, but yes. Um. <laughs> yeah, and the, the beauty of adopting a policy and then issuing in accordance with that policy is that you can always fall back on the policy if someone gets a little bit ruffled by it. So that's why we would promote setting out the objectives initially and viewing an RFP process in light of... Yep. Uh, yep. No, it's, uh, uh, I think we agreed in earlier discussions that it was a good idea and something we just hadn't hadn't come up before. Yeah. And now that it has, uh, we need to have a, a, a systematic and thoughtful approach to it. And so we're grateful to, to uh, help us get uh, prepared for, uh, for that. And there's no need to reinvent the wheel entirely. A lot of what these other municipalities have done can be a good starting point sure. or guidance. So when, when do we next have a uh, license coming up for renewal? Uh, not, not for some time. We're doing, um, the commission already voted to renew the license for Elwell, well, but that, that's also an organic parcel. And it has only those organic parcels that's required for the license. So if not, I think until 2016 employment. So we got a couple of years before we would be able to exercise whatever we develop. Okay. And let me ask you about the um, Sylvester Road parcel. It was just renewed, and at that time, I think they were saying it was a three-year lease, but now you're saying something about... That goes until 2017, oh, okay. at the end of that calendar year. But if I understood what Laura said correctly, uh, you can issue a new policy at any time and simply notify all of your farmers that you have a new policy that they need to come into compliance with. And I suppose you could give them a certain amount of time to come into compliance, but I don't see why it's required to wait until the end of the lease time period to uh, issue a policy. Well, that's a good question, um, <laughs> whether you can change the rules after you've signed a binding agreement. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that we can't. Um, Oh, that's uh, an interesting question. It, it would be the equivalent would be that um, uh, you know, if, we, if, if the farmer decided to change practices after a and you know, I, I think we have to. Uh, uh, well, I, I, certainly, that's worth worth asking whether we can retroactively modify uh, an existing license. But I, I, I would be. I would think there's some ethical problems with that. Yeah. Just even if you're actually, you're uh, like. You're renegotiating for the same compensation. Yeah, I mean, it, it might be if they were willing to agree, then it, yeah, could agree. but I think it also would probably be, in my opinion, to play fair and not ruffle a lot of feathers. I would, I would issue it <laughs> later. But well, I think we could issue it at any time, but just in terms of it would be uh, prospective rather than yeah, retrospective. Yeah, exactly. I agree with that. On the other hand, I see no harm in having a conversation with the farmer, given oh, yeah, that no, no, he's no, aware absolutely. that neighbors are affected by it and neighbors are troubled by it, and that this is a, you know three more years of them enduring periods of, of whole-scale roundup 
you know, on the, in, on the entire site, whether or not he'd be open to shifting some of his crops so that the one at that very site doesn't, you know, negatively impact. Yeah, and he, he, was, he was very um, considerate about my wish to be informed about when it was happening. It was a very difficult um, process of figuring out exactly when it was, but he was really trying to work with me. I mean, because of the weather and the rain and, you know, um, I'm forgetting right now the name of the company that does the spraying. What is that? Anyway. Um, just finding out from them, but he was really trying to keep me Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to suggest that we wait three more years to, to get around to thinking out of, uh, what kind of policy we might want to adopt. Uh, uh, just that I don't think we could force mm -hmm. its adoption by current uh, licensees. Uh, yeah. uh, no, but, but that doesn't prevent us from talking to them. About we it. could send it to the licensee and say, this is what's going to happen the next time you come in right. for renewal or whatever. And to the extent that you can move in that direction before then, that's a, that's a good thing. So, because it uh, had been, um, it had been <coughs> hey, like I guess he switched his farming practices maybe three years ago or so. He had been growing hay before that. Well, and and what we uh, typically do is regularly, um, in addition to the permitting work, which is the majority of what we do, uh, we build in some portion of some meetings uh, to talk about. Uh, writing policy, amending or recommending to the city council uh, uh, amendments to the uh, wetlands ordinance, the city ordinance, uh, uh, sometimes definitional uh, work so that we have some standardization in terms of how to apply. Uh, the, the, so we, we periodically set aside hours for doing work that isn't about any specific um, application. So. Uh, this is now on our list of one of those things that we'll set aside time to address. Thank you. Well, thank you. This is, uh, this is, we, we usually are in the position of somebody makes a presentation and uh, uh, then we have a, a, the uh, basis for action. Um, and that uh, because we only do have a third of the Sarah rather than a full time staff of several like other things. Um, it's a very useful way for us to get some of the materials that we need to be able to go forward with this case. So thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. And you're welcome to stay. <laughs> I assume we're going on to other topics. Though. We are going on. <laughs> right. Next on the agenda is the uh, continued discussion of the Considering the amendments to the land use regulations for the conservation commission to allow hunting on one or more parcels. Um, I guess the, <coughs> the first question is uh, we have had, uh, including when we had the, uh, the large public hearing at the uh, junior high school, uh, we had complete attendance of the commission. And uh, my sense is that I'm, I'm reluctant to act on uh, this without the complete commission having a voice. After we've gone through all of this, we've had three hearings. Uh, we've had, uh, including the, the, the big one with a couple hundred people in attendance, um, I'd be reluctant to say, uh, all right, now one more than a quorum is going to act. That doesn't prevent us from having some discussion, um, but I just wanted to suggest that we delay any final action until we can have a, a, a complete membership. What do you think? I'm willing to do that because most of the time we are all here. Right. That's my sense of it. Is that, is that not true? No, that's, that's true. Most of the time. Most of the time we are all here. I mean, uh, putting it off, we always have the possibility that we're not all going to be here. Of course. Of course. <laughs> At some point we'll have to make it a decision. And there might not be one of them. That's true. Like in January, I will likely not make the first meeting in January, so it'll probably be the last week in January that we're all here together. Well, I think that. And uh, I would like to be here. So this is a. You know, uh, all of us would. So yeah, it's hard to make a decision. Yeah, I did, uh, and, and I know we were targeting this as a day to make a decision, um, but. Uh, 
you know, it, 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 I, I'm interested in what Cynthia and Danny would have to add to the discussion, and I'm reluctant to have uh, one more than quorum uh, make the decision without that input in their absence. So now that that's a separate question from um, do we want to have some discussion this evening? Uh, uh, and just for purposes of members of the public, we had uh, uh, in, in the beginning of the meeting um, uh, a couple of uh, comments from the public, but we're not opening the hearing at this point for additional, after uh, three hearings and uh, many hours, uh, we've gotten a lot of public input. Uh, and uh, also lots of uh, <coughs> written documents. Thank both of you for your more recent uh, uh, Bob and Jane uh, sent uh, comments in the last couple of days. Um, but um, shall we begin a, a, a process of discussion, or shall we well, wait until? We're putting it off because the other two members aren't here. Then I think we have to put off the discussion because they're not here. Because they're not going to hear it. They're not going to hear it. And what they see in the minutes is not going to tell them what happened. Yes. Uh, so Tim, you will not be here the first meeting. It's the second week, and yeah, I have to look, but I'll be usually away during January anyway for the first two weeks. So it's the, so I will is be it the ninth? The ninth. Is the first yeah. meeting. Yep, right. I'll be away then. And so then two weeks later would be the 23rd? 23rd. Back? Yep, I'm back. I'm back. I have every expectation yes, uh, <laughs> being, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I know Daphne was, had a late child care emergency and, uh, and there was a passion emergency as well. But both of them were planning to be here. Okay. You're talking of December? No, we're January. talking January. January. But, uh, <coughs> uh, wanting to see if we can identify a date when Yep. All of us would be sure to be present before we uh, uh, make a decision about this, since there's been so much public interest. So um, I, I would, uh, I mean, for both reasons, I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't want it to be uh, perceived that a subgroup made a decision after all of this work. And in practical terms, I'm also just plain interested in what. Uh, Cynthia and Downey have, I'm not and all of you do, but I mean, that because we can't talk about this except when we're in public hearing, I don't actually know what everybody's been thinking and look forward to finding that out, but I, I think uh, Steve's right that we should uh, not begin that process when we have something this present. Sound right? So we'll defer until the next meeting. Sarah, does it look like we're going to have a uh, heavy duty agenda that week? Or? We have nothing yet for January. No applications. No applications. Okay, good. Well, probably something will come up, but still, uh, it doesn't look like we'll be crowded out. I mean, Christmas time usually isn't too bad for applications, so we may be pretty late. So. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for coming, those of you who wanted to hear where we came out. Uh, but uh, I, I, we had uh, two commissioners late this afternoon at 4 o'clock uh, have emergencies come up that prevented them from attending and we were lucky to proceed without the whole of the commission present. So we'll do it in a month. Do the meetings normally start at 5? Pardon me? Normally start at 5? Yes. Normally start at 5. Today we did it at 6. Uh, okay. But normally so 5 o'clock on the 23rd? 5 o'clock on the 23rd. Would be so that be when there's been some discussion? requests from the public about this topic in particular but not have it be so early so maybe we should schedule it at six schedule it at six because we could still because have could still applications have applications before beforehand right. and then have it that's at six right. that's right so why don't we say that yeah, I think people a little more flexibility to that out of work reason reason that we've always had people from yeah. Yeah. people say if it's a public interest question they have it later right. but I think that's reasonable so so the meeting will start at six well, the meeting will start at five, start this at five. topic, but the hunting will start but at But if six. people want to speak out, they need to be here at five. Well, actually, you should probably look at the agenda, because if we don't have any topics on the agenda, then we might just start at six. What do you think? Because yeah, right. if there's nothing that's come up, then we would just start at six. And um, the that has to be advertised in advance. My, my, my it will plan be advertised. Is it has to be. It's always advertised. Yeah. 
My plan uh, is, Mark, that the yes to allow uh, public comment at the beginning during our normal public comment session, but to, to limit the hunting-related comments to a, a specific amount of time after the number of hearings that we've had. So I mean, 15 minutes or something. Like that. Haven't there been no comment already? Yeah, that, my, my thought as well. On the other hand, we don't want to close off all and, the and I mean, I haven't put any more comments in, and I don't want to, but if I hear that other people have been, no, I'm thinking twice. <laughs> I, I truthfully think it should be over, right. the comments. Well, I, I, that, that, that would be our, our preference, and I, I doubt that there's much that's new that we haven't already heard and we're not fairly well articulated from the number of sources. Uh, on the other hand, I, 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 there may be, there's a possibility that uh, uh, Anyway, I don't want to close. I don't, I, I, I don't want to arbitrarily close off discussion. I do think that we can limit it. However, if there are people who want to say something about this topic, we can limit it to 15 minutes or something like that. Um, but yeah, the, I think yeah, the post, as time gets closed, no later than a week before, uh, there would be a posting um, on the city website, and that would say if there uh, are. Uh, other applications or business that uh, comes in that we want to uh, kick off at the normal 5 o'clock start time, then um, the uh, public comment period would be at 5 o'clock. If not, then it would be at 6 o'clock. Um, all right? All right. That's it. <laughs> That's it? Well, we, 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 we have other... Uh, yeah. None of these other things. No, we do a video, we do a past chapter. Second one. Yeah, all in favor.